Good afternoon, Lori. Hi, Lisa. And welcome. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So let me tell our listeners a little bit about my podcast guest today. Her name is Lori Lewis, and she is an intermittent fasting coach. She has recently written a book, and she'll tell you about her book. And um, I think you were a life coach, right, prior to this? I actually had a career in retail and managing big teams of people to create amazing spaces for people to shop in and including I worked for JP Morgan Chase and um, I got my health coach certification 10 years ago just because I wanted I had a personal passion for nutrition, but I hadn't used it until the last two and a half years. Oh, interesting. And then do you also have some kind of integrative nutrition, some, you yeah. have a, some kind of nutrition certification, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's this amazing school in New York city called the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. And they used to op- offer all their programs live. And then the year I got certified, it's a year long program was the first year they did it on an app on your phone remotely. So that was a big step. Wow. That was about right. 10 years ago. Yeah. Excellent. So I reached out to Lori. I met Lori through some of our intermittent fasting Facebook communities. And um, that was the thing that brought us together. But I was drawn to Lori's personality and her journey because uh, she's done some amazing things. And I wanted her to share her story with our listeners. So Lori, tell us about what you used to do and how it segued to what you do now, please. I would love to. Okay. I'm a Colorado mountain girl. I love my snow and my blue sky and sunshine and my mountains. But when I was five years old, I saw the sparkling lights of New York city for the first time. And I said, this is my place. These are my people. And so my whole childhood, my parents were like, who is this child? We're raising you in this idyllic environment. And she just wants the bright lights of the big city. So, um, I first moved to Boston after college and lived there for about six years. That was a good get, you know, transition, <laughs> but I was always on my way to NYC where I lived for just about 25 years and something called me West again. So now I live in Portland, Oregon. I didn't know how incredibly grounded I would feel living there. And right now I'm coming to you from the mountains of Colorado again. So we go full, full circle, but I've always been in service. I love making beautiful environments and having people feel comfortable and serving people's needs. So it's kind of a hospitality mindset in retail environments. And I've worked for incredible companies like Patagonia, and Tiffany and Ralph Lauren. And back in the day, remember Laura Ashley when Laura Ashley was alive in flowery dresses and flouncy skirts? That was me. <laughs> I wore them. I wore them when I first started. I know. Working. So cute. So cute back so, in the 80s. <laughs> so it's funny because, you know, I was born in the Bronx in New York City and my parents moved us to the suburbs. So I grew up in Rockland County, New York. I don't know oh, if yeah, you I know. know it. Uh, right on the Hudson River. And then I went to college at the Crane School of Music at Potsdam, which is up by um, the border of Canada. Beautiful. Beautiful. And then I settled in the Mid-Hudson Valley and I lived there. I was a New Yorker my entire life. And then I just recently went west, southwest. So I'm in Tucson, but my daughter lives in Colorado. And um, I have a lot of friends, a lot of friends in Oregon for the same reason that you are there because they feel How does it feel good? It is a good feeling place. And it's so diverse that we have the coast and Crater Lake and our beautiful mountain and the beautiful river and the west or the eastern part of Oregon is a desert and then the big tall trees. It's fantastic. And beer and wine and coffee. (laughs) Yeah. And we'll be there. We're going to the Oregon coast next summer when it's safer to travel. Good. So, Lori, tell us about um, the job you were doing when you lived in the big city, and how did you transition to your coaching job now? Well, I just how I transitioned to coaching from a lifetime of retail is I um, had about a year and a half of amazing success as an intermittent faster. And I know we'll talk more about that because we share this journey of eating in a pattern of time and healing every day. So I'd had extraordinary success with my intermittent fasting journey and 
subsequent loads of people were asking me how to do it. And so I did my very best to tell friends how, and I was at a wedding in Philadelphia in October of 2018. And I got cornered by a ton of friends and they're like, you have to have a class. You have to teach us how you have to take our money. I was like, I'm not going to take your money to tell you to stop eating. <laughs> and they're like, you're so arrogant. We need your help. And so I agreed. And then I had the crazy idea, which was well better sooner than later. So we started during the holidays of 2018, literally from the Halloween candy to new year's champagne. I taught people to eat in a pattern of time and that's bold. Was, that's really it bold. was it's like so jump. 20 people. Jump. I was a zoom pioneer. I had to teach everyone how to use zoom oh. and I don't have to spend time doing that anymore because everybody knows how, and we had a weekly class live on zoom and it was incredible. And as we rounded out that one, the next one, they're like, when are you doing the next one? Cause I have a friend who wants to come and a friend who wants to come. And within six months I started to have, I had a brand new website. I'm like, I guess I'm doing this. <laughs> you know? And so, cause then people were like, well, I don't really do the group thing. I could, don't feel, you know, I have right. a crazy schedule and I'm super busy. I just want to talk to you. I want the customization of one-on-one. -on -one. So group leading groups. And I like creating my own classes and then one-on-one. -on -one. And so I had my little website, which um, was very exciting. And after only about six months, I would wake up in the morning and there would be a new order from a person. I had no idea who it was. That was very exciting. Because <laughs> up yes. until that point, it was a friend or a friend of a friend or someone's sister. Oh. And um, to see a name in my inbox that someone had read my website and signed up for a program or signed up for the one-on-one -on -one personal coaching. And I didn't know who they were was exhilarating. So were you doing this while you had your day job or what was happening in your life at that point? Well, I was a casualty of, um, at JP Morgan Chase, I was the vice president accountable for all branch branding, which is every Chase branch, 5,600 Chase branches around the country have a, a uniform look and feel and vibe and story and marketing and all of it. And so I was accountable for that. And branding is not essential. So there was a big slew of layoffs and I was one of them. And that was right, really right about the time that I moved to Oregon. And so I started freelancing and piecing things together and it was incredibly challenging for me. I discovered quite abruptly and powerfully that I value having coworkers. I like, I mean, it is kind of a pain to wake up and take a shower and put on a cute outfit and commute somewhere and show up in the office. And yet I really like going to work with a team and having people that I work with. And so I, I was very challenged by my freelancing consulting, you know, strategic marketing and branding work. And so this came along and because I get to talk to people all day long about the topic that I am so passionate about, I never get tired of it. And it's growing and booming and thousands of people are living more healthfully and happily. Yeah. So I want to touch on a couple of things you said. So um, first of all, service, you know, I was a teacher mm -hmm. and like, so I think that's one of the things that drew us to each other because we, you are, this is how you're making your living, but you're paying it forward. Like you're doing it oh. out of intent. And the other thing is, um, you know, the name of the podcast is Bending the Trail. So you were on this path or trail in your, you know, big business, New York, and then you had to re really reinvent your whole trail. And, but you made it work for you, what makes you happy. Like, I agree. Like, I love people. Like, this is pandemic has been very difficult for, for me. And now I'm like, yay, I get to talk to people on my podcast. So we each find, we know what makes us happy. And we have to find those things that make us happy and we make them work. And so you, hello, you like Nero, you really bent your trail, Lori. <laughs> uh, you know, I have always been this way though. Like 
it, it, adversity hits and it seems like, wow, this is the worst ever. And, and I had a friend reenact once my friend, Julie, she reenacted what it's like to be Lori Lewis when like you get <laughs> blindsided and you're like flipping in the air and it's like, Whoa, which way is it going here? I have no idea. I have no idea where I'm going. I have no idea where I'm landing, but you know what? I know that I'm going to land on two feet in some unfamiliar terrain and meet incredible new people and have some amazing new thing on the horizon. And it's all going to be sparkly, amazing. It's going to be great, no matter how dark it is. I've amazing. always been that way. So yeah. you're very resourceful. I am too. Ooh. I'm always like, yes. okay, I'll go in the back door. I'll go in the side window. So, so Lori, um, I, I want you to tell our listeners about your, um, how you came to airman and fasting, because it's really a beautiful story on multiple levels. So um, some people might already know your story from some of the other podcasts, but I have a, a different group of people listening. And I, I love the new people, new people, <laughs> new people. I was going to tell you about herself. Go ahead. Please. Oh gosh. So fun. Well, it isn't, it, it's important for me to reflect on and remember how hard it was like, wow. So I, I love the name of your podcast, Bending the Trail. And I love that you're a runner. I come from a running family and yet I never considered myself a runner, even though I've been running my whole life because my dad, okay. My dad, this is total sidebar. You have to keep me on track, but That's my okay. dad came home from a business trip in 1972 or three. I can't remember. And he'd been running in his tree torn tennis shoes, like actual tennis shoes up until then. And he came home from a business trip in Portland, Oregon with the weirdest looking shoes. My brother and I were crying, rolling on the garage floor with holding our bellies with laughter because that Nike waffle stomper running shoe was the most ridiculous thing we had ever seen in our lives. So that was the beginning of our serious running, but my brother's a triathlete. He's run the Leadville hundred miler. I mean, it's oh, just Leadville. like, you know, he ran cross country and track in high school and college. And I just, you know, dabble here and there, but in my forties, I really buckled down with my running and my friends were like, okay, you think you're not a runner, but guess what? If, you and if you're running a half marathon or 26.2, <laughs> you can hereby consider yourself a runner. And so I have a few marathons under my belt and I was lean and strong in my forties. I, I felt like I was at the top of my games. Like, I don't know why people don't like turning 40 because this is a jam. This yes. is awesome. And then dun, dun, <laughs> <you know? laughs> menopause. Oh my gosh. You know, they don't send us to biology class for older ladies. And we've kind of heard there's some hot flashes. I don't know. There's some, you know, room hearsay about this or that. But because it comes piecemeal and there are random symptoms, a long list, we don't typically put it together like, oh, that depression is part of it. Oh, you know, the, just all the physical ramifications and mental and cognitive. So I hit, I had struggled with perimenopause. I hit menopause at 49, which I guess is early. The average is 52. And immediately I gained 50 pounds. Now, I mentioned that I have this health coach certification because of my passion for nutrition. I always say I ate the exact same way for 20 years. I kicked my sugar addiction, never drank a soda anymore. Like I kicked the, all those habits 20 years ago. It was hard, but awesome. And I ate magnificently healthfully real whole food for 20 years. Everybody thought of me as like the healthiest eater they knew. So I ate healthfully for 20 years and was lean and strong. Then I gained 50 pounds. I didn't change anything about how I ate and I lost 50 pounds. Again, not changing anything about how I ate, but when that 50 pounds came on, you got to know, I tried everything, all the old tricks that worked to lose 10 pounds, 20 pounds when I was younger, nothing budged. And uh, to compound the 50 pound weight gain, I had memory loss, total brain fog. Like I could be in a conversation with you and not remember what we were talking. I could ask you a question. I just asked you five minutes ago. I, my equilibrium was off, so I couldn't run. I couldn't, I had no, I was so fatigued. I fell down an entire flight of steps in the New York city subway, the whole steps on eighth Avenue and 14th street face first. So I was in bad shape and four and a half years of misery. 
I came home to Colorado to visit my mom for a long visit. And when I came home, she said, let's use this time that you're here to turn the weight around. Whoops. Yeah. Whoops. Okay. Now it's interesting when some people, usually men hear me say that they're like, oh, that was so nice of your mom. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Now as a daughter, I, you know, in, I was 54 years old. I'm 58 now. Well, I'll be 58 on Monday. Um, those are not the thing that, uh, those are not the words you want to hear your mom say, because it implied that I hadn't been doing anything. And I was so miserable and I was trying so hard and I was in so, I was in constant physical pain, like aching head to toe. Well, she, I wailed and screamed and cried and said, you know, you have no understanding, <laughs> you know, and said meaner things, I'm sure. And she listened beautifully, which was her extraordinary talent and listening, loving ears. And she said, well, let's pray for an answer. Cause that was like, what else are we going to do? And that night I went upstairs in her house and I tucked in. And as we do, I got out my phone and I probably Googled like hormonal menopausal, stubborn fat, you know, old lady, help me, you know, <laughs> it was just like all the things and up popped the words intermittent fasting for the first time. I'd never heard. I, I knew there was fasting, like long therapeutic fasting at hypocrisy. Hippocrates or true North or people go to Costa Rica and water fast for whatever. But I never knew that you could live a life of pausing from eating and then eating delicious foods in an eating window. I had no idea. So I stayed up all night watching videos, reading articles, reading the research, trying to figure out like, how do I do it? Is it as easy as it sounds? Like, this is amazing. So I came downstairs in the morning and I said, thank you. I think I found an answer. And I told her, I described it. And she said, how may I support you? Yeah, how may I help you? I love that. So I want to just um, interject here for a minute. So when you were going through all that perimenopausal stuff, because I've been there too. Hello, yeah. Um, and I love, I, there's so many things. So I've heard the story before. You talk about, they don't do biology for the perimenopausal. <laughs> no. You know, they do it for puberty, but then like when we get hit 50, it's like, you're on your own. Now, and we're not even allowed to say I know, it's like out loud. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> so I want to ask you, I know you're very natural, a natural path kind of person. Had, did you go for any medical care or advice? Like I want, I'm curious if, as to what happened with you in the medical community. Cause I know for me, I had a, do a woman doctor say, uh, uh, you're 50. This is how it is. I'm like, oh, no, it's not. No. It's not going to be like this for this person. So I'm curious, you're in the city. Like, what was your experience or did you even seek medical advice? I did. I did. And I went to a functional medicine doctor and she did all the tests, but at the end she prescribed bioidentical hormones. Uh -huh. Now I do not disparage anyone. You make whatever choice really, truly. There was something I don't know what, and I was seeing an acupuncturist. I was doing all the things I pulled out all the stops. And plus I had extreme adrenal exhaustion, adrenal fatigue. So I was, I was a mess. And, um, I saw that functional medicine doctor, my thyroid, I, I don't know. I'm the only woman I know who dodged the thyroid bullet. I, I, my thyroid is working just fine. And, um, she couldn't figure it out. She couldn't figure it out. And intermittent fasting wasn't a conversation then. And I just thought, I knew enough people who really struggled with taking the exogenous hormones. And I, I just felt intuitively like my, like it was going to balance itself out. And there was something I needed to know and learn and implement. And it just took longer than I wish it had. Yeah. No, it's, I think intermittent fasting is, um, it's becoming a bit more mainstream. Like that's sort of my measure for a doctor now. Cause you know, I just moved. So it's like, Oh, yeah. is it okay with you if I intermittent fast? And if they say no, then I'm like, bye-bye. But anyway, so you sat with your mom and she said, how can I help you? And I just yeah. like, uh, I just, I could picture her saying mm. that after she said, oh, let's fix this. But then she was there to help you fix. How can I support you? Yeah. So then you, I think you started immediately, right? Lori? Oh, that day. Right. It was June 12th, 2017. Yeah. Oh, 2017. So, okay. Yeah. So I've hit my, I think 1400th day. I've never missed a day. And 
you, you know, I want to tell people too that never missing a day means that you're always conscious and aware of how long you're fasting and what your eating window is. And does it have to be the same every day? Of course not. I've done 12, 12, some plenty of days when I had a fun wine festival that I went to in Virginia with a bunch of friends, you know, so there are special occasions that I extend, expand my eating window or move it around. But every day since June 12th, 2017, wow. I have eaten in a pattern of time. And it took 15 months to lose 51 pounds. But the most important thing is I felt like myself within three days. Oh, within three days. Okay, so I want you to say that again. You started intermittent fasting and within three days, you started to get a little more clarity of thought. Yeah. I, yeah. Oh, hello. So this is why, like, why don't doctors suggest this? Well, like, they should if they read the New England Journal of Medicine. When a doctor says they don't think it's a good idea, they are not up on the research. And that is concerning. Having Them having an opinion about it is interesting, but for them not to know that the New England Journal of Medicine had a huge review in December of 2019, cognitive, physical, emotional effects and benefits of intermittent fasting, encouraging physicians to literally prescribe a fasting regimen to their patients. Like, come on, doctor, come on, people. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dr. Jason, Dr. Jason Fung says um, it's healthcare is, it's not preventive. It's like here it is. So it's like, you know, my, I go to a, um, a natural doctor. He's also a chiropractor. And he says, everybody should be intermittent fasting and everybody should be in That's ketosis. Right. And he's, he's like open, you know, to read, like we bring him articles, he reads them. So, right. so you started, so when you started intermittent fasting, you said you'd already been eating very healthy. Yep. Um, did you start, I can't remember, did you start at 16? Like what was your eating window and your not eating window? It seemed really easy for me to skip breakfast. That was not a problem. So I've always, I've always enjoyed black coffee, believe it or not. The only reason I ever put anything in my coffee was to cool it down so I could drink it quicker. <laughs> so, so the idea of taking all the stuff out of my coffee was not a problem at all. And, you know, delicious, high quality, organic, fresh ground beans, there's nothing better. So, but what I did was I went straight to the health food store and bought boxes of fancy tea, like detox tea and activated charcoal, I don't know, ginger, lemongrass, all the things. And I thought, well, if I'm fasting, I can, you know, detox. So what I discovered was within two weeks, I realized I was a little slow. I realized that every time I drank a cup of those fancy herbal teas, I got super duper hungry yeah. after drinking the tea. And I'm like, well, this is no fun. And I put it two and two together. I'm like, I don't actually want to feel this level of hunger when I'm fasting. So I think I won't be having that tea. Well, a month or so after that is when I discovered Jen Stevens, who wrote Delay, Don't Deny, and has now a new book called Fast, Feast, Repeat, who coined the phrase, the clean fast. And I figured out quite naturally that plain water, plain black coffee is the way to go so that it makes it easier to fast so that I'm not getting that, you know, a hunger wave. You, you have yeah. So too. can you, you explain hungry. just yeah. um, for our listeners? Um, Cause a lot of people might not understand if they're not in the fasting community. So what Lori is saying that these fancy schmancy teas that she bought may have had some other flavorings in them, which maybe they were zero calories, but what happens to us when we're fasting is if we taste anything sweet, like even if it's like right now I'm drinking a, like a lemon seltzer. If our body, if our tongue tastes anything sweet, it could be like cinnamon or chicory or lemon mint. or mint. Our body says, oh, guess what body? Food is on its way. And then um, the pancreas starts secreting 
insulin and that can make you hungry. So that's why we're not militant here. We're just saying if you want your fast to be more pleasant and you don't want to have horrible hunger pangs, you don't want to do the stevia, the zero calorie sweeteners, anything with like a flavor like vanilla tea, zero calories. Exactly. That's nice. But vanilla, your body's like, yeah, vanilla. So um, just if anybody is um, thinking about starting an intermittent fasting program, um, it may seem counterintuitive, but it's once your tongue tastes anything with a sweet flavor, it thinks party coming down, right? That's right. <laughs> and I'll add a dimension to that. So we're, we want to put the body in a hormonal, metabolic, and digestive rest. So I'll add not only the sweet flavor, but anything that communicates to the body that food is incoming. So that th those digestive detox teas, uh, like get your whole digestion going, which is like, oh. no, 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 we meant to give it as a rest, a uh. healing rest. So uh, you asked about my fasting pattern. I did start with 16, eight, right? It's just seemed like, yeah, I'm not hungry in the morning. I can enjoy my coffee and then have some, some plain water. And uh, as soon as I ditched those herbal teas, fasting was much easier. And then really within about two weeks, I squished my eating window to six hours. You know, I had a little lunch with my mom and then an early dinner. And um, it was just such a joy to be in her positive, loving environment in those first weeks. And then I went home to New York and continued. And uh, I think within six weeks, someone, yeah, early August, someone challenged me to a 20 hour fast. And I was like, whoa, there's, I don't know, the difference between 18 and 20 seemed, wow, yeah. but I did it. And then it wasn't a hard push. Like I like to say, you don't want it to be a hard, push. you wouldn't go to yoga. You would go to yoga and have a nice stretch, like stretch yourself. But you know the difference between a good stretch and a hard push, uh -uh, don't go there. So it can be challenging. It can be a good stretch. You can push yourself through it but not push to a point of causing yourself strain and suffering and dread. And yet I found for myself, my fasting home really is a 20 hour fast every day. And I have tried everything. I tried all the things and I just naturally settle back into a 20 hour fast and a four hour eating window, even though I met my goal, you know, two and a half, um, yeah, two and a half years ago. So you're saying you um, you do your time restricted eating, you don't eat for 20 hours, and then you have about a four hour eating window. Is that like one meal? Do you have like a snack? Like, how does that work for you? I love this idea of how Jen Stevens, our mentor, um, describes one meal a day. Okay. It's like you're in a restaurant where you have the bread basket and maybe some olives and a little appetizer and a salad. Do you want some soup? Do you want, and then you have your main course and you might have a drink, then you might have a little dessert. You know, that's a nice lingering meal. Do you have all those parts every day? Probably not, <laughs> but I take the parts of one meal and enjoy it over a four hour eating window. So I say I do OMAD one meal a day in four hours. And so I liked, and I recommend that people try this, opening my eating window with some fat, some olives, some creamy goat cheese, some, I don't know, half an avocado with some yummy spices on it. And then I pause because that fat really quells any sort of ravenous feelings and also keeps me alert. And then I'll have my big meal later and boy, do I eat a lot. So this is not a, a thing of calorie restriction. This is eating delicious foods to abundance in an eating window. I've, I've had people say to me, I don't think I could intermittent fast. I like food too much. I'm like, have you seen me eat? Yeah. And <laughs> Do you know how much I love lasagna? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's a big misconception because I do intermittent fasting and like I ran 10 miles this morning and I, um, you know, I'll have like an opener and that, because this way I'm not like, when we get to dinner and right. then I eat, like I'm a tiny woman, like you should see me eat, but then I stop. And for me, it, um, I appreciate my food much more because I'm oh. fasting. And I also, for me, it also, um, I had some disordered eating and it, um, 
it freed me up from the worry, like the binging and the restricting. Now I'm not afraid because I don't, I feel like I'm in control and not the food. Does that make sense? I love, oh yes. Now I, the, one of the most common things I hear from my own clients and students is this idea of control. Control is a funny word because control can also imply controlling, like, like constrain and, and effort. But I think the kind of control that you're talking about and that people experience is that I have agency. I have choice. There isn't like this loud clamoring noise in my head of fear and constant pressure and being drawn towards things that I know are bad for me. Everything I like to say that this isn't a diet, it's a quiet. And in that quiet, I get to say when I'm going to eat, what I'm going to eat. And then the body naturally through this healing of fasting steers us towards the foods that it most wants, which is very different than, than um, craving ultra processed foods and sugar and so forth. The mm -hmm. body naturally steers us towards delicious, healthful foods. And so that control, that, that feeling of, wow, I actually have a say, and it doesn't take this effortful willpower, you know, it takes some determination sometimes, but that's very different. Yeah. I like to think of it as um, intuitive eating, but allow, like I allow my body to say, Hey, Lisa, tonight you're going to have blah, blah, blah. And, um, and it's also about thinking of food. I like to say, I don't live to eat. I eat to live. That's just yes. the way I like, like to live. All right. So I want to talk about your coaching, Lori, and, and your book. And um, I know <laughs> I, have, you. I have your book. Yeah. So let's tell us um, about your coaching business and how can people find you? And I know you do groups and you do uh, individuals. So, and you have people like all over the globe, I think now. So tell us a little bit about um, your new, well, it's not new, but tell us about your coaching. It is so much fun. I, I, I truly, I, I, I work round the clock because I do have clients everywhere from Japan to New Zealand to, to Seoul, Korea and Scotland and Ukraine. I mean, everywhere and the U S and Canada. And, um, I absolutely love every minute of it because each person's experience, struggle, age, you know, upbringing, what they're challenged with right now is unique. And so I am here with my ears and my heart wide open and every conversation, like I have enough experience coaching thousands of people in intermittent fasting that I, they're trends, right? They're thing commonalities, but there's no cookie cutter way. And out of, that's why my sessions are 45 minutes and not 20 minutes. Like some, if you look up some intermittent fasting right coaching programs. It's like $225 for 20 minutes. I'm like, you can't even, how do I even know you in 20 minutes? Right. And in that, our first session is 75 minutes. So I really, I ask a lot of questions and then the following sessions are 45. And I find myself piecing ideas together and things coming out of my mouth in terms of a plan or a solution that I've never said to anyone else before, because I'm listening so carefully to each individual. And sometimes it, the healing can be slow. This is not a quick, you know, you think, oh, I stopped eating. I'm just gonna lose 20 pounds overnight. No, no, probably not. So my weight loss was quite methodical. I even, and, and I would say slow and healthful. I um, had a five month stall on the scale. The scale did not move, but I got two sizes smaller, my body shrank and the scale stayed the same. And, you know, we, I can explain why that is, but you know, there were moments when that was frustrating. It's like, I had the arbitrary number that I had selected as my goal. It's completely made up. Um, and, and it wasn't budging for a while there. So that can be frustrating, but I, someone said to me, um, today, actually this morning, she's like, I'm afraid if it stays slow, I'm going to get discouraged. I said, well, good for you for having a coach. And she's like, oh yeah. <laughs> right. So, so I want to bring this up because um, some people just do intermittent fasting on their own and they can, but um, of course, and, and the beauty of it, it is free. You don't have to go to like meetings, but for some people, 
they need that support. Like for me, I'm okay on my own, but I have to say like, I'm in the running and athletic community and there's a lot of opposition among runners to fasting. They think you have to pre-workout, post-workout. So oh I'm fine because I got my husband and I'm always like a very determined to do what I know is right. But if someone's in a community like that, it's I think it's very helpful to have somebody like you say, no, 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 no. This is why you want to do this. And it's not just about weight loss, right, Lori? A lot oh. of people come to it for healing. Uh, oh, healing everything from auto eczema to warding off Alzheimer's. They're now referring to Alzheimer's as type three diabetes. It's partially a matter of high circulating insulin yeah. and the brain being fueled with glucose instead of ketones, which are made by from burning our own body fat. So the high circulating insulin is, is the danger zone. And that leads us into prediabetes and type two diabetes and Alzheimer's. And so yes, everything Infl inflammatory inflammation. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're saying yeah, that um, Alzheimer's and depression um, is, is they consider it inflammation of the brain. So, right. so you do um, individual and you have, you run some groups too. Right? I do. I love the groups. I love, I love both. Some, some people seem to have a talent for one and, or the other and don't like the other, but I absolutely, I'm so lucky. I love creating my programs. I love leading them. And so I have a four, I, I dabbled, I did eight week, I did three week. I, I'm now settled into this four sessions in five weeks live on Zoom. And then in January, I tried it for the first time. I lead twice in one day. At first, it seemed daunting. I'm like, wait a minute, you know, junior high or middle school math teachers teach seventh grade algebra over and over and over again. I can lead my class twice in one day, right? It's like, what am I, I, ta I taught? Of? I taught six classes a day when I taught middle school music. Yeah. Six. Like, Thank you very on, much. Right? Yeah. Like, suck it up. <laughs> like, get going. So I lead a morning class where I live because that's the evening in the UK and Europe and Africa. And oh. then I, so I lead at 10 a.m. in Portland and yeah, 10 a.m. and 5 p.m which is also then good for the U S and Canada. So I lead the exact same program twice in one day. And when I experimented with it in January and February, the students asked, like, can I attend both? I'm like, if you want to attend all knock yourself out, if you oh. of course show up for all of them. And then it's like double the recording. If you miss a session, it's recorded. So then the next day, I'm not just sending one out. I'm sending two to everybody. Oh, if you want right. to watch them all go for it. It's great. I, my next one, well, I'm sure this, the beauty of podcasts is they're timeless or evergreen. Someone could be hearing this a year or two from now, but um, right now it's March of 2021. And the next one starts on March 24th. <laughs> and then there and, will be more. And and the students, I'm sure, inspire and help each other, right? They, That's do what's they so cool. Right? Yeah. You hear someone ask a question that you yourself had or were too afraid to ask, or someone will say, some challenge they're having. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm, me too. Or someone will say something amazing that happened. Like my plantar fasciitis went away after I debilitating for 10 years in the morning, the, the pain shooting from the bottom of my feet was just excruciating. And within three to four months of intermittent, at some point it disappeared. And this happens in the group programs is that someone will say something disappeared and they're like, oh, me too. So it's really great. One funny thing that people notice after they've been intermittent fasting a long time is your elbows get really soft. Did you ever notice this? Feel your elbow. Oh, interesting. Yeah. It's like no more crunchy, <laughs> crusty elbow. And yeah. everybody's like, oh, my elbows are soft. Yeah. I had, I had several things that improved. Um, but I had a spot on my chin that I had been going to the dermatologist, you know, they freeze it off with that machine yes. and I had multiple freezings and he, I was supposed to go back, but I skipped it because of COVID. And then like just last week, I said to my husband, I said, honey, it's not even just gone. It's like smooth. So yes. it was, it was like the actin keratinosis, something it's like a precancerous oh. and it's like, and now I'm out in the sun all day, but, um, Ooh, so that was, so there's so many things. And, you know, um, I have a history of, clinical depression. So for me, fasting, it's, it's one of my, you know, wellness tools for my mental health. It's like, if people give me a grief, I'm like, stop, just stop. Like you, you don't know what's going on inside my head. <laughs> yes, exactly. I just, people are like, why do people intermittent fast? I'm like, bottom line, 
people want to feel better. And I've worked with some marketing people and they're like, that doesn't sound very sexy for an ad. I'm like, okay, I'm sorry, but that is what everyone says. If I, if I pulled everyone out there in your audience and your listeners, it's like, bottom line, I just want to feel better. I want to get on the floor with my dog and jump back up and not be like, ow, 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 ow. Mm-hmm. I want to sleep well. I want these aches and pains to go away. I want to, rather than getting on more and more medication, the idea of getting off or reducing the dose, it's so, so incredibly appealing to feel better. It is. And some people don't realize how poorly they were feeling prior. And then they go, oh, Whoa. so yeah. So I, I want to talk about a couple of things. Um, The running, and now I know you said you do more gentle exercising, if I'm correct. So can you talk straight to that? Oh, no, ramped it up. Oh, well, well. I I know. Okay, so here's what happened. So with the adrenal fatigue, the adrenal exhaustion, and the perimenopause, and then the all the debilitating aspects, including 50 pound weight gain of menopause, I, I, it's just, it was all I could do to barely keep up a gentle yoga practice and walking, being a New Yorker, I just walked everywhere, which I kept up, you know, I moved to Portland and I deliberately rented an apartment near the hills where I could go up in the woods. Um, So I maintained my yoga practice, which was incredibly healing and grounding. And after intermittent fasting for about nine and a half months, all of a sudden, one day, I had this little thought, which was, it was like a voice. It said, you can run again. You're good. You can run again. Well, I didn't start running. I joined Orange Theory, which is as intense as it gets. I was all pumped up. I'm like, you know what? I don't feel like strapping on my running shoes. I feel like going to that studio that just opened up down the street and they had a free class to see if you like it. And the first day I was like, holy smokes, this is right up my alley. You spend 20 minutes on the treadmill, steep incline, running fast. You follow the coach's instructions. Then you move to the rowing machine, row, 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 row. Then you move to the weights, pump up. You know, it's different every time. Oh my goodness. Incredible. I love it. I haven't been in a year because of COVID and they just opened the studio back up, all the distancing, all the precautions. When I get home to Oregon next week on March 11th, I am resuming my orange theory intense workout that, that'll be your birthday <laughs> your birthday treat yes um, happy birthday to you too yeah so Lori and i our birthdays are um she Lori's march 8th and i'm march 9th so yes. how cool is that so i i want to touch on so many things so you mentioned when you were um in new york and you were doing half marathons and marathons and you thought you weren't a runner i just i do want to jump in here because you know i'm a big fitness enthusiast if you yeah. run a, a 5k you're a runner if yes. you run a mile, you're a runner. This is how you, you become a runner. You put on your running shoes and you run. So I want to put this out because some people, you know, I have a lot of friends who walk and they want to start running. And if you run a mile, if you run a half a mile, you're like, yep, I'm a runner. So you don't have to run a half marathon. You could go into your little 5K. And I just want to remind people that there's a lot of walking in running. Or if yes. you're a hiker, you know, I live right near the mountains. I'm in Arizona. I do a, a lot of hiking. But I also think... <laughs> Um, they're finding that sometimes less is more. So if you start intermittent fasting and you want to increase your exercise, it's sometimes right, Laura, you don't, you don't want to do everything at once. You don't want to make all the changes. Oh my gosh. It's so overwhelming. The most important thing is to teach your body to eat in pattern of time and everybody's different. And so it can be a few days of Usually within the first week, people come to the second session like, wow, that was so much easier than I thought it was going to be. That's a relief. And then you can hit a little bit of a hump around two or three weeks because that's when the body has used up the glycogen stores in your liver and you are literally shifting into fat burning every day. Once you're in fat burning every day, you have this beautiful, even energy. And so it's really fun getting people through those first few weeks and do one thing at a time learn how to fast. And then your body will be like, okay, now I can increase the extra. If you're already a runner or already a a yoga enthusiast, or just be gentle within those first four weeks, be go, go easy. And then you can start to increase. And, you know, a 5k is an, a, just an amazing accomplishment. It's amazing. Yeah. So, so the point being is 
you need to reward yourself for any of your successes. If you're oh, like, all oh, of them, I just hiked a mile, like it for you. So Laura, I want to talk about your book because I have it. And I just, I want to say this to the listeners. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. So I ordered the actual physical book because you, I think you can get it on Kindle. I don't remember, but I, I like touching. I'm a teacher. I like to write. I like the tactile. So let, tell us about the book and how that came to be, please. Thank you. I started jotting down notes on legal pad um, almost from the beginning. Like if I heard a way of saying something, or if I listened to Dr. Jason Fung or Dr. Eric Berg or Dr. Mindy Peltz, we have a video and they said something in a way that I could then articulate it to others because they're complicated scientists. You know, some people love the science, but most people are just like, just tell me what to do and maybe explain it a little, right? So I kept notes in my iPhone and I kept notes on paper. And I, I just thought that they might be useful because people were asking me to articulate how it works and how to do it. Then maybe, I don't know, a year and a half in, I thought, well, I... I felt like there was no book that really explained how to start. Okay, so Delay, Don't Deny was an amazing, inspiring book. Same thing with Kim and Ryan Smith's book, Unbelievable Freedom. But for me, I got to the end of the book and I'm like, where does it say, how? like, do this, do this, do this, do this. So I thought, well, I'm going to do a do this, do this, do this, do this book. And I wrote a book that was a lot longer. And then Kim Smith came to me and said that she was putting together a workbook series where experts in lots of areas were going to put a, put together a workbook that people interact with in her series. I was like, yes, that resonated with me because I wanted people to be in action. I didn't want them to get to the end of the book and be like, well, now what do I do? So I recommend that people get the hardcover, the the cover of the book is beautiful. I hired a, just an exquisite 19 year old artist to create the cover of the book, which I wanted to impart to people. It's all okay. It's not downhill from here. You have a vibrant, bright future. I'm listening. I'm here with you. I got you. And the name of the book is Celebrating Your Vibrant Future, Intermittent Fasting for Women 44 to forever. Okay, so and, you cut out a little. So let's just repeat the title of your okay. book, please. Celebrating Your Vibrant Future, Intermittent Fasting for Women, 44 to Forever. So I love that, 44 to forever. I like, I just love that because it's like an alliteration yeah. and and yes. um, to forever. So I'm 60, I'll be 61 next week. And I'm already an experienced intermittent faster, but I was like, this is great. I, I was like, oh yeah. So I got like some tidbits and it was also affirming. I'm like, yep, I'm already doing that. And then I was like, yes. oh, what a great idea. So I want to put this out there. If you're new to fasting, it's a wonderful, amazing, necessary resource, I would say. But if you're already experienced, it's always good. Like I'm, I'm a singer. Like I always take voice lessons because I'm like, I can keep learning. So you can keep learning in your intermittent fasting journey, right, Lori? Yes. And what I decided to do was I had this much longer book written and the hardest part of writing this workbook was shrinking it. So if someone else takes 10 pages to explain insulin, I wanted to do it in two tiny paragraphs. I wanted to do it in such a way that if you were like, how do the glycogen insulin how do i tell my friends that it's actually increasing my metabolism what do i say again that you can flip to those pages and it's such a short snippet that you can then memorize that and say it to other people so there's a whole section on what do you say to others and logging and tracking and writing down your feelings and it's it's awesome and so i recommend getting the hardcover reading it cover to cover in the back pages, there's a love there too, but write the first love letter to yourself. Seal it up and go back and start interacting with the book. And yeah, experienced fasters as well. So many people get it because they're like, okay, it's kind of been a slippery slope. I haven't been watching my fasting hours and my eating windows quite as tightly. And, or they still have a goal to reach. So 
get the book and do the 90 days of logging and reflecting and following my instructions and you'll just tighten it right up. It's very yeah. fun. And for me, um, it, it absolutely is intermittent fasting related, but um, you know, I was struggling with a little bit of sadness because of COVID and the isolation. And it was a, it's just a great journal, like about reflecting about life in general. That's so I just wanted to share that. So Laura, thank you. You're, thank you. So we're, um, we're getting towards the end. Um, so I know we could talk for like three hours easy, but we can't. So, <laughs> um, so you, I mean, you really made some big shifts in your life. you you're obviously you're very brave and you're highly intelligent and um, and you're spiritual. So any advice you would give to someone that's kind of lurking, thinking my life is really this is not my true calling. How, what kind of advice hmm. would you maybe give to someone? Well, you know, I I really respect Elizabeth Gilbert for kind of correcting herself along her journey because she really felt and preached that we all have a calling. We have to follow our calling. And most of us are like, I don't know, I, I have a calling. How do I know what that is? You know, So that's a lot of pressure. And I think she realized through her teaching and her own life journey that maybe we, we don't have to know the calling. What I think we have to do is follow our heart every day every day. If this makes my heart sing, keep doing that. If this makes my heart sing, if people are listening, if people feel good around me. If, and so I actually have participated. I've been following a woman named Kathy Heller for years. She spoke at a conference I attended in Portland and she has a podcast called Don't Keep Your Day Job and a program called Made to Do This. And in that program, she literally gives each individual permission to follow their heart yeah. and do any little thing, anything, any, because it's the things that we just naturally do that we don't think are any big deal that other people will pay for. <laughs> other people want what we have, but we don't know it. And so I am so grateful. I, I, I truly, when I sent my book to my mom a year ago, the dedication is to her. I'm just going to open it up. And I thought my brother said, you know, she's not going to read it. And I was like, yeah, I didn't, I didn't think that she would. It's all right. I just wanted her to have it because it says for mom, thank you for my life, your transcendent love and the miraculous words. How may I support you? And she read the whole thing and oh, she, she called me and she said, this book will bless so many people. She said, it is full of love. It is. It <laughs> and is. the first, the first words of the book are, this book is a hug. Like, it is. come on, I got yeah. you. Yeah. So, um, so I'm glad your mom got to see the book because I know she recently passed and, yes, um, she did. And, um, you know, we've been in touch a little bit through that journey because my dad just passed away in October. I lost my mom 14 years ago and every single day, Lori, every single day I miss my mama. But yeah. um, you, there's so many things, but you and I, I think we both um, have huge, huge gratitude. And so, um, and I think that's what's drawn us together. So obviously you're grateful that you're able to help people, but I, the audience, you can't see Lori, but, but I can, and we're both wearing <laughs> matching colors. You know, we match, we've got on, we're like, oh my goodness, we look really good together right now. <laughs> so, um, let's just talk about gratitude and gratitude and fasting, because, you know, I'm a runner and I'm around these people that go, oh, I got to run my three miles. And I'm like, yay, I get to do this. So for me, when I fast, I don't go, oh no. I got to go all day without eating. I go, mm. yay, I get to fast. I get to take care of myself. So let's just finish up with a little bit about gratitude, please. Oh my gosh. I don't know. Where do I even begin? I mean, my heart is just bursting there. I, I think that one of my talents is listening so keenly and shining a light on what a person's experience is so that they can see how amazing they're doing. Because I, I really think, 99% of the time I get on the phone or get on zoom with a client and they're like, Oh, I did this wrong. I did that wrong. I didn't do it perfectly. I'm feeling so remorseful. And, blah, blah, blah. and then I like get a clear picture of what happened. I'm like, Oh my gosh, you're doing amazing. You did this. You did this. You did. They're like, Oh, I didn't see it that way. <laughs> so I think we need each other. 
we, I'm, I'm just so grateful for each other, uh, each otherness. And um, I'm grateful for technology, which isn't, doesn't always get the praise it deserves that here we are face to face in different parts of the world, communicating, lifting each other up, sharing our stories. It's a miracle. Yep, it is a miracle. And I, I, I also have a lot of gratitude, but I also, I believe in sort of the, the collective consciousness. And I think if people like open up their hearts, they'll, they'll find the, the path, the bend, the bending the trail, you know, where they need to be, right? If they just oh. lose it. Yes, we're bending the trail. All right. I so think, I don't think we'd want a straight one. No, ew, ew. Look at my hair. I got curly hair. So Lori. <laughs> I was just going to say the straight part of the New York marathon is the worst when you cross the 59th street bridge and then you have to run forever yeah. up first Avenue. I'm like, could it turn already? Yes. So yes. I'm all about bending the trail, baby. <laughs> Good. So um, I'll, put, I'll put links in the show notes, but why don't you just verbally tell our listeners, please, um, if people want coaching, I know you're very busy, but uh, tell us your website and where we can find you and things like that, please. I would love to. My business is called Fast Forward. So it's fastforwardwellness.com. And it, it explains about me, explains a little more about intermittent fasting. I've got a little three minute video there where I talk about my work. You can click on the link to purchase my book and um, you can look at the group programs and the one-on-one -on -one coaching and reach out to me. You can write to me from there. So love to hear Excellent. from Excellent. And you can also, you can get your book on Amazon, I think, because right? yes. I think yes. that's where I got it. You know, I'm very grateful for Amazon because they don't, I don't have to print a whole warehouse full of books and try and sell them, that they are printed to order and shipped to you. And I love that. All right. So Lori Lewis, much gratitude to you for spending some time with me today. On um, Today is March 2nd. My birthday is um, next Tuesday. And I think yours is next Monday, right? Yes, International Women's Day. And that's the one year anniversary of the launch of my book. Oh, great. <laughs> All right, Lori. So I'm going to say goodbye. And um, thank you to our listeners. And please find Lori Lewis. I'll put links in the show notes. And thank you so very much.